as well. Ah. Oh, that's fine. Okay. No. I'll just use the mouse, I think. Okay. I think it only works if I have like... How do I get rid of this thing again? <laughs> no, it's... I don't know. Okay. So I'll just use this mouse, I think. Okay, so our next speaker is Sophie Beck <coughs> from the Flatiron Institute and her talk is about correlation effects and realistic materials modeling with DFT plus DMFT. The floor is yours. All right, thank you for the introduction. Uh, can you hear me all right? Or should I speak closer? Closer? Close to the microphone, yes. Okay. Uh, welcome everybody, good morning. Thanks for, thanks for coming. Also, welcome to those on, on Zoom. Uh, my name is Sophie Beck. I'm a postdoc at the Center for Computational Quantum Physics in, at the Flatiron Institute in New York. And uh, yeah, I will talk about uh, correlation effects and, and dynamical mean field theory. So this is just to give you a broad overview of what uh, DFT plus DMFT means. Uh, this is essentially, uh, as you can see from this image, okay, my mouse doesn't work. Uh, DFT plus DMFT kind of stands on three pillars, one of them being density functional theory, then downfolded Hamiltonian, which we use Vani 94, and then the DMFT part. So, uh, you know, I also want to just thank all the developers and, and kind of inventors of Vani 90 already uh, for, for their work, because without it, uh, this kind of method would not work as, as it does right now. Um, right, so we've heard in the past few days a lot about uh, how to construct a uh, localized uh, kind of downfolded Hamiltonian. Um, so I will focus mainly on dynamical mean field theory and then in the second part I will uh, talk about the Trick Software uh, project uh, that we're going to see also in the, in the uh, hands-on session later. And I also want to thank the organizers for inviting me. This is a really, really great workshop so far. So, uh, right, as I said, I'm gonna do uh, a, an introduction to DMFT, and I'll talk briefly about uh, charge self-consistency with quantum espresso, Vani 19 tricks. Um, and then the second part uh, is going to be about the tricks software package, the basic uh, building blocks, which is the tricks library, and then I'm going to focus on two applications, tricks solid DMFT and tricks Fermi C, which uh, my colleague, uh, Alex Hampe, who's in the audience, and I have spent a lot of uh, time working on, and also with other people. Um, and then uh, we'll go to the tutorial in the next hour. So I'm going to start with this uh, Nature article by Tokura, Kawasaki, and Nagaosa, uh, where they talk about strongly correlated electrons, uh, materials as a next generation electronics. And you see they kind of identify four key uh, aspects about, that are interesting about strongly correlated materials. And we've heard in the past few days also about topological prop, uh, like properties. But today I'm going to focus on, on, on Motronics and you see here, they, you know, the key concept they identify is electron correlation, and then there's also kind of a target industry for kind of high, en high energy efficient electronics or energy harvesting. So this is a really uh, kind of interesting field. And what makes strongly correlated materials so interesting is that they have a complex interplay between lattice, orbital, spin, and charge degrees of freedom. And what this means is that they're very sensitive to small changes in external parameters, such as uh, change in temperature, pressure, or doping. And this gives rise to a kind of what we call rich phase diagrams, where they host uh, a couple of different uh, kind of um, phases, uh, such as the famous high TC superconductivity, colossal magnetoresistance, multiphoric uh, phases, or kind of MOT physics, which I'll focus on today. The materials that we consider strongly correlated are mostly those with open D or open F shells, so those that are kind of marked here. Um, uh, I've also marked ruthenium, you're gonna see or hear me mentioning ruthenium a couple more times with its kind of cell, seven electrons in the D shell. Um, so these are the transition, uh, transition metal uh, D shells or the uh, rare earths or actinides that, are, that we consider strongly correlated. And just in terms of this kind of next generation electronics, what makes them also very special is that uh, due to like tremendous progress in, in thin film growth techniques, Experimentalists can nowadays really kind of grow these materials atom by atom, so very similar to how we kind of drag and drop atoms in Vesta. Um, and they can exfoliate them, grow them really in atomic layers, and 
This gives rise to this kind of materials by design principle where we would engineer materials to be in a specific state that we could uh, use for electronic applications. And here's just one example of a, of a prototype of a mod transistor based on thin films of various nickelate uh, that supposedly uh, switches much faster and is more energy efficient, or this kind of prototype for a mod solar cell based on uh, the mod insulator lanthanum vanadate. That would have a higher uh, energy efficiency than current semiconductor uh, solar cells. Now, let me define a little bit more closely what strong correlations means. Um, I will actually define the opposite. This is something that um, we're mostly, like everybody here is uh, very familiar with, uh, what I consider weakly correlated systems. So these are systems where we can use an effective single particle picture, and this means that we can construct the many-body wave function from a, from a product ansatz where we assume that the particles are independent, then we anti-symmetrize them and we get a Slater determinant or a linear combination of Slater determinants. And of course, this is the kind of the typical uh, band picture where you have for each momenta, for each band, you have a, a, a concrete, like a, um, a single eigenenergy, and this gives uh, these bands. And if you think about this in real space, uh, you can imagine an electron moving through a lattice potential uh, and just uh, interacting through an effective uh, potential. Now, strongly correlated systems, uh, they're defined by exactly the breakdown of the single particle picture, where you don't have bands anymore, but now you have a spectral function. And you see in the spectral function, there are kind of these washed out areas, but then there's also uh, areas of very high density. Um, and we're gonna define what this, what this is in, in a bit. And in the real space uh, picture, now you imagine kind of electrons moving through, an, through, through, uh, through the lattice, but now you really have to think about the time dynamics of what these electrons do on the lattice, how they interact with each other. And this is uh, kind of where dynamical from dynamical mean field theory comes in. And right, so these strongly correlated systems, uh, the kind of uh, the, um, what causes the strong correlations is the local Coulomb interaction that we've also heard in the previous talk. And uh, these systems are often between ionic localization and itinerant behavior, what makes them very interesting. Now, the spectral function that uh, I've just showed, I want to briefly define what that is. So the spectral function is uh, more or less uh, this commutator of the usual um, annihilation and, uh, uh, um, I forgot the other word, creation operators. So uh, we're gonna create a particle at location zero, at time zero, and we're gonna measure the correlation when we take out another particle at later, at a different uh, location at a different time. And this is essentially what the Green's function is. Um, and then we can, so this is in real space and, and time, we can Fourier transform it, and then uh, we get a, a lattice Green's function uh, as function of momentum and frequency. And if we take the imaginary part, then we get the spectral function. And the spectral function is exactly what uh, experimental colleagues would measure in photo, photo emission spectroscopy, uh, in particular um, uh, ARPES, uh, except that they would only probe the occupied side of the, of the spectrum. Now, in the non-interacting case, um, we've already talked about this in a non-interacting case, so this is kind of a band diagram with K in, in plane and the, and the frequency. You have specific eigen, eigenstates for each momenta, and this forms your bands. And in this case, the Green's function has this uh, typical shape, so this is the non-interacting Green's function, which is one over frequency minus uh, your uh, cone charm or tight binding Hamiltonian, plus uh, an, a small broadening, otherwise this thing blows up. And the spectral function, the corresponding one, is just a sum of like a series of delta peaks, which is exactly what, you know, what, we, what we'd expect. Now in the interacting case, the picture changes a bit. And the change is mostly that uh, instead of like having this delta peaks, you have uh, quasi-particle peaks, which now have a different, can have a different height, they can have a different width, and so they kind of get a lifetime to them. And uh, of course, the kind of the integral has to be conserved, so uh, the spectral weight that uh, decreases at the, at the Fermi level is gonna move to, to the Hubbard bands, which are kind of more um, atomic-like excitations at higher and lower energies. And in terms of theory, this can dis 
can be described if we add uh, a self-energy. So this is what we call this uh, big sigma. Sigma is a complex quantity, so it has a real part and an imaginary part and is frequency dependent, most importantly. And the corresponding spectral function, uh, now you can see that uh, the eigenenergies, the previous delta peaks, are now shifted by the real part of the self-energy. So this is a kind of a quasi-particle renormalization that can change your bandwidth. And then you have a, um, the imaginary part that acts as a scattering and kind of uh, washes out the effects. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, what we can learn from this uh, spectral function if we do some approximations. Uh, we can talk about uh, quasi-particles. So this is the, the image that I showed before, the spectral function, and the self-energy that corresponds to this. This is, by the way, strontium ruthenate. I warned you about this. Um, so this is a self-energy that corresponds to this uh, spectral function. You have the real part uh, as function of frequency and the imaginary part as function of frequency. And uh, if we want to define quasi-particles, uh, we can, if you look at this picture, we can still find kind of maxima of this, of this uh, intensity plot and define this as quasi-particles, and this is exactly what you see in this plot now. These blue dots are now the kind of the maxima of this previous intensity plots, and the red, uh, red lines are the, is the tight binding Van Nye Hamiltonian. And you see exactly this kind of band renormalization, so you change the bandwidth a little bit. And if you, if you, want to, if you do this, uh, you can kind of factorize or you can um, uh, split up your Green's function into something that we call coherent part, which are the quasi-particles, and the incoherent part. And for the coherent part, uh, you now have a quasi-particle of renormalization Z, which is uh, one minus the real part of the self-energy uh, and the inverse of that. You're going to have a renormalized quasi-particle dispersion, which is just the eigenvalue equation if we take uh, the, the Kohn-Sharp states minus the real part. And then you're going to have a scattering, which is the inverse lifetime of the particles, which come from the imaginary part. Okay, so this works as long as uh, the imaginary part of uh, the self-energy is not too large, but we can actually um, break it down a little more if we really just focus on the low-frequency regime uh, where you know, most of the interesting physics takes place. So if you look at the self-energy in this regime, you can see that uh, you can approximate, you can, you can expand your uh, self-energy uh, as a Taylor series, and you're gonna have a linear term in the real part of the self-energy and a quadratic term in the imaginary part of the self-energy. And this gives you an analytic form for the self-energy that is very interesting to study. Uh, kind of, this is the, the liquid, uh, the Fermi liquid regime, um, where things uh, simplify a little bit more. So Z is now a frequency independent uh, constant that you get from the slope of the real part of the self-energy so you, you just take the slope, uh, do one minus and, and the inverse of that. And this is also the kind of, yeah, as I said, the quasi-particle renormalization. So this is related to the mass renormalization of the electrons. And then the scattering, scattering rate is just uh, the imaginary part of the self-energy at zero frequency time set. Okay. So um, if you feel still a little bit uncomfortable with the concept of the self-energy, let me remind you that there's one particular type of self-energy that you're most likely very familiar with, which is that of uh, DFT plus U calculation. So in DFT plus U, you would have zero scattering, which means that the quasi-particles still have infinite lifetime. And you also have uh, zero frequency dependence in the real part of the self-energy and a zero, zero slope, which means that your quasi-particles are not renormalized. And uh, you can, you know, from DFT plus U, you can get, uh, you can, uh, the only, well, you can get a, a frequent, um, an orbital dependent kind of shift in the real, in the, in the quasi-particle, in the, in the eigenstates, but you won't get an insulating state unless you break translational symmetry. And this is really the kind of fundamental difference to DMFT. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the mod, uh, metal insulator transition, so kind of mod physics. Um, historically, uh, typical control parameters are kind of bandwidth control, where you change the ratio of the Coulomb repulsion over the bandwidth, and this can be achieved by applying pressure, either kind of like pulling your pulling your sample out or like together, or by chemical uh, pressure. Then there's filling control, which you can achieve by uh, uh, electrostatic or chemical doping, and then there's a kind of a trivial uh, mod transition, which is by temperature, and then there's also dimensionality control, but in some ways they're uh, also related. So in practice, what this looks like is that uh, these materials, of course, they have uh, complicated phase diagrams as I introduced. So here's, you have temperature versus, uh, actually I'm gonna take this axis, temperature versus uh, pressure. So this is an example for bandwidth control. This is uh, vanadium-203. 
Um, so essentially, you can change the hopping parameters or the bandwidth by applying, uh, applying pressure, which actually you get via doping in this case. And for vanadium-203 in the ground state, you're in a paramagnetic uh, metal phase. But if you uh, decrease or if you apply negative pressure, you go into a paramagnetic insulating state. And of course, there's more phases down here, but that's not so important right now. Another examples are uh, rare nickelates, uh, where you can change the bandwidth by, like, uh, by a tilting angle, by exchanging the A-side cation, or a nickel uh, sulfide selenide, where you can change the bandwidth via effective hybridization to the, to the ligand states. Now, the other thing, filling control, that's the kind of the typical example. Uh, this is uh, lanthanum-2 uh, copper oxide. Um, so here you have temperature versus hole concentration, and uh, this is really kind of a phase diagram of the pairing compound, uh, where you have uh, an antiferromagnetic insulator, and then if you apply, uh, well, hole doping, uh, you go into all sorts of weird phases, the pseudograph phase, then the famous superconducting phase, but also the metallic phase. Okay, and we're going to actually uh, do, in the tutorial, we're going to look at this, uh, this uh, material. All right, so mod physics in, in theory. Uh, this was all already uh, wonderfully introduced by the, in, by the previous uh, lecturer, uh, Professor Aita. Um, so the most fundamental uh, or most basic kind of uh, model that we can use to describe a metal insulator transition is the so-called Hubbard model, where you have two terms. One is the hopping term, where uh, you know, the kind of the uh, amplitude with which electrons move around from one side to another. And then you have the local onset repulsion that electrons experience if they are located at the same side. And this model looks uh, deceivingly simple, but I can assure you it's not, at least in, in more than one dimension. And I also want to remind you that <laughs> you might, be, might, might have become you know, more familiar with the Hubbard model in the past two years, you know, with this kind of internal competition between wanting to leave the house and move around and not being too close to somebody who's coughing. Um, I keep waiting to take this slide out, but <laughs> I think we're getting there slowly. Um, right, but let's go back to the, to the Hubbard model and we look at the limits. So if T is much larger than U and uh, we take the half filling case, then what we can do is we can just take single particle picture and describe electrons moving around uh, in, in this lattice, which is you know, exactly what DFT is about. And the system is metallic, so that's, that's a simple case. If we take the other case where T is much, large, uh, much, much smaller than U, um, the system is essentially just a, a bunch of, of isolated atoms. We can do exact diagonalization, it's also not a problem. The problem is really the intermediate regime as usual, and this is, uh, however, the interesting regime. So if we had uh, a wish list for a theoretical method, then we would kind of wish for uh, it to be able to, to handle the competition between itinerant and localized states. Uh, we want to describe both quasi-particles, but also atomic multiplets. Um, we have to constantly switch between reciprocal space and the real space. We want to describe all sorts of frequency regimes, low frequency, high frequency, and we want this to work on kind of models, but also from, from ab initio. And as you can imagine, the solution kind of <laughs> is DMFT. So in DMFT, uh, we start kind of again from a, from a lattice model, which is the Hubbard model, and we can map this lattice model to an effective impurity model. So we take an atom that is kind of embedded in a bath of non-interacting uh, non states, and uh, the coupling is described by a hybridization function that has a frequency dependence. So again, this is the dynamical part of that DMFT so that we can really capture the time dynamics of what happens at this specific site. And this impurity bath coupling, uh, this is to be determined self-consistently. And if you want to read more about this, uh, of course, the kind of review articles are, uh, are a great recommendation. Now, in order to understand this a little bit more, um, we, can, we can start from, from classical mean field theory, where usually you have a lattice model, uh, you have a local observable, and then because you cannot really compute the lattice model, you're gonna construct an effective local model and uh, describe uh, the interaction of, of your, I don't know, your local observable with, uh, with the rest of the, of the particles via an effective medium that we call Weiss mean field. And you have to solve this uh, self-consistently. And so for the easing model, what this means is you have this Hamiltonian of interacting spins. Uh, you're interested in computing the magnetization um, your effective local model is a spin in an, effective, uh, in an effective medium, and this kind of effective medium or vice mean field is just uh, the, uh, the product of, of your J, your, your exchange coupling, 
and the number of, of nearest neighbors. And uh, after doing some algebra, you can get to the self-consistency uh, uh, condition, and you can actually solve this graphically in this case. Now, you can already guess uh, in 3 DMFT, we cannot solve it graphically. <laughs> um, okay, so DMFT is a little bit more complicated. So the first, uh, first line you've already seen, you're very familiar with the Hubbard model by now. Then the local observable that we're interested in is the impurities greens function, uh, which we compute, which has this kind of shape of um, uh, annihilation and creation operator that we've seen before, time ordered. Then the effective local model is the Anderson impurity model, which has an impurity Hamiltonian that is just a crystal field levels uh, plus an interaction Hamiltonian. Then we coupled this to an effective bath of non-interacting fermions. And this coupling is described, so the coupling, so this has, you know, uh, creation annihilation operators A, and uh, the impurity has C, and so here you have a, a bilinear coupling uh, described by these uh, coupling constants V. And so the vice mean field in this case is what we call curly G, um, and this is mostly described by this coupling V and uh, the, eigen the, the eigen energies of the non-interacting path. And so this second part of the curly vice, uh, the curly G is the delta, is the uh, hybridization function. And we can also relate this uh, curly G with the impurity Green's function or the local Green's function and the self-energy via the so-called Dyson equation. And so for the self-consistency, what we'll have to achieve is we have to kind of equal or we have to, yeah, we have to get the local uh, lattice Green's function to uh, agree with the impurity Green's function. And so the local lattice Green's function means that I just do a sum over K where I kind of uh, average over, over the momentum degrees of freedom. And once the impurity Green's function and the local Green's function match, then I've achieved, uh, then I have self-consistent solution. However, there's one problem. So here you see kind of this uh, self-energy coming up again. The problem is that we don't have a momentum resolved self-energy. Self and so the fundamental DMFT kind of approximation is we have a local self-energy and we can take this local self-energy from the impurity and put it in, in the lattice Green's function and this approximation becomes exact in the limit of infinite connectivity of your lattice. So that's uh, kind of the fundamental outline of DMFT, and we have to solve this numerically. And uh, by far the heaviest part of this work is uh, solving this uh, impurity problem, quantum impurity problem, and there's a whole range of impurity solvers out there. I, I don't have time to talk about this today, but uh, yeah, uh, there's a lot of uh, lectures out there. So I know this is a handful, kind of a, a lot of equations. Uh, here's kind of like a schematic overview again that is a little bit simpler. So we start from, from your non-interacting density of states or non-interacting Green's function. In this case, it would be the Vani Hamiltonian. You construct your local Green's function, which is just the sum over K. From this, you can construct your curly uh, vice mean field, uh, which is in the first iteration is identical to the local Green's function. Uh, you solve the impurity Green's function under kind of the action of this vice mean field. And then you, from this uh, impurity Green's function and the vice mean field, you can, cons you can compute the self-energy and you plug this into your let lattice Green's function and then you iterate until you converge. There's one example where this is particularly simple. So DMFT people love the, the beta lattice. Um, it has this structure, so you can see it's not a crystallographic lattice. It's an infinite Cayley tree. But what is interesting about this is that if you go to the limit of infinite connectivity, so here each side has three neighbors, but if you do this for infinite kind of neighbors, you can get an analytic expression for the density of states. And this is a, just a semicircular kind of semi-elliptic density of states, which of course is not too far from, from you know, what we know in our, in, in our materials, even though it's not a crystallographic uh, lattice. And in this case, since you have this analytic expression, um, your DMFT self-consistently simplifies drastically because you can, like, you can automatically plug your impurity greens function back into your curly G and just iterate over this thing. And I'm gonna, I've showed you this because uh, I will show you later how you can kind of code the self-consistency in tricks in, I counted less than 12 lines. <laughs> but of course, in a, in a more general case, if you want to do real kind of real like material calculations, it's, it's a little more complex than that. And so the success of DMFT can be shown by looking at this kind of phase diagram of the Hubbard model where you have temperature versus uh, Coulomb repulsion. And uh, you have, even though this is a, you know, the, the details of this phase diagram are gonna depend critically on, or not critically, but like gonna depend quite a bit on the specific material that you want to study, uh, the overall kind of phases, they're uh, actually quite, 
you know, uh, quite well represented by the Hubbard model and fit uh, many materials. So on the left-hand side, for low interaction, you have a Fermi liquid, so a good metal. And then uh, on the right-hand side, you go to a paramagnetic insulator. At uh, low temperature, of course, you're going to enter an ordered phase, magnetic or orbital order. You have a first order transition where you have kind of, uh, you lose the, the metal at this uh, kind of transition line and you lose the insulator at the left one. Then you have a second order critical point and above that you have something that we call a bad metal or a bad insulator, bad insulator, not a band insulator. And if you kind of move uh, horizontally from the left, from zero interaction to the right, uh, you get this kind of very famous picture uh, where you start from a, just a normal non-interacting non density of states. You increase kind of the correlation. You get this kind of infamous three-peak structure. And at some point, you open a gap. And this is exactly what this um, metal insulated transition is. Okay, so this was kind of the general overview over dynamical mean field theory. So how do we combine this uh, with density functional theory or kind of ab initio methods? And uh, we've already had a great overview over this in, in the previous talk, uh, but I'll just briefly walk you through kind of the ingredients, what you need for this calculation, which is mostly kind of, we call them projector functions, but in, in the Vani language, they're just kind of the U, uh, U mat, I guess, the, the U matrices, the unitaries, which is the overlap between your Vani functions and the Kohn-Sham states. Um, then you need, uh, of course, the, the hopping, uh, hopping terms, hopping integrals, and you need an interaction term and then you can run your DMFD, and after that you can get uh, kind of post-processing steps, you can get uh, spectral functions. And if you want to know more about this, I recommend in particular the, the amazing collection of, of uh, lecture notes of the Jülich uh, Autumn School and Correlated Electrons. And I also will briefly talk about uh, a recent addition, um, which is uh, if you want to achieve charge self-consistency, you of course have to kind of update uh, you also have to iterate over the over charge density uh, going back to DFD. And I also want to mention that the whole kind of workflow is implemented in, in solid DMFT, uh, which uh, you're going to use in the tutorial later. Okay, so as for the uh, ingredients, um, we kind of start with the target band. So this is the slide for you kind of to relax. You've seen this now several times in the past few days. So you kind of have your band structure and you create maximally localized Vanier functions for what we call target bands, uh, which you know you identify as uh, being not uh, being or being strongly correlated and that need additional kind of uh, treatment. Uh, so you start from your Kuhn-Sham states and uh, you uh, create the with a you know the usual Vanier functions at lattice side i and orbital index alpha. I'm going to use a slightly different annotation, and then you have your hopping elements if you evaluate uh, your Kuhn-Sham Hamiltonian in terms of these Vanier functions and integrate over over a real space. Then a slightly subtle thing that I have not mentioned so far is are these projector functions. So um, kind of in this dichotomy of constantly changing between the reciprocal space on the lattice and the local space in the impurity space, uh, we, we do something that we call downfolding or upfolding where we kind of sum over, uh, sum over K and you get a local quantity and then for the upfolding you do kind of an embedding. And this is handled uh, by these projector functions um, which are most of, most of the times unitaries, um, but yeah, so this requires a little bit of thinking, um, but uh, you can get these from, from, from Vani 90. And then you do the reverse once you, do, uh, once you embed the self-energy in, in, in your lattice screens function. Uh, as for the interaction Hamiltonian, I've showed a slightly simpler form before, so this is a kind of a quadrat, uh, like a four-body kind of um, Hamiltonian in the most general case. Um, this is usually a very complicated object. Uh, we've, we've seen in the previous uh, lecture by, by Professor Arita how we can use constrained random phase approximation to compute uh, these uh, Coulomb tensors. Um, so in the kind of simplest case, uh, if we have a, just kind of the bare Coulomb repulsion, this is just like the, the Coulomb uh, operator evaluated in the, in the Vanier functions. But this, is a, this would only be valid for kind of like an atomic picture. And of course, you have these screening effects, uh, which was, were also discussed in a pre, uh, previous lecture. Uh, so this is a, a little bit of a complex business. But um, aside from that, this form usually simplifies drastically if we have uh, kind of a crystallographic kind of cubic matrix where we embed the atoms. In this case, many of the terms actually um, are zero by symmetry. And so then we have uh, what we call the, the usual kind of Hubbard-Kanamuri interaction. So this is now just five terms. 
and you have like the first line are density density terms where you have um, um, you know um, uh, two spins of the same orbital uh, two spins at different orbitals and then uh, of the same like uh, of the same orientation at different orbitals we have now to take into account the exchange interaction and then you have um, uh, also spin flip uh, and pair hopping terms Okay, and so for the next step, you're gonna have to use an impurity solver. For this, I recommend the lecture by uh, Olivier Parcoulet from the Arnold Sommerfeld School in 2017. And once you've solved your DMFT, you can analyze spectral properties. Uh, most of the impurity solvers actually work on the imaginary frequency axis. So then you have to kind of, uh, you have to use uh, analytic continuation uh, to transform this back to the real frequency axis. And once you have that, you can compute something like these Fermi slices so this is data by a colleague of, of mine, Xiaodong, uh, for strontium ruthenate again, where you see the kind of the, the red uh, data is, is calculated and the blue shade, shade, shaded area in the back is uh, um, ARPES measurements by, by Anna Tamai from the University of Geneva. And you see that in this case, so this is a, a material with spin orbit coupling. You see that, of course, DFT kind of without spin orbit coupling is not, is not a good, uh, good way to, uh, to approximate the system. DMFT without spin orbit coupling is also not great. Once you add spin orbit coupling, you kind of improve the agreement, but only if you add kind of what we call correlation induced uh, kind of effective spin orbit coupling, you actually get excellent agreement. And then there's also a couple of more post-processing steps that you can do. You can compute optical or thermal conductivity. Uh, you can compute susceptibilities or kind of two particle correlation functions, Hall, Seebeck coefficients, uh, resistivity, and so on. And uh, because of uh, this, yeah, I briefly wanted to talk about optical conductivity uh, because I, uh, this is also kind of a, you know, one of the wonderful things about the Vani 90 community. So I, um, Last year, so prior to, to last year, this was only calculated in tricks from bean to k, and uh, I, I wanted to update this uh, to include uh, start, starting from Bunny 90, and then I stumbled over the, the great papers by, by a lot of people who were present here, David and, and Ivo and uh, Jonathan, and uh, I actually asked in the, in the user forum, and I got uh, within two days or so, got a wonderful response by Ivo and, and Stefan, and this is really, uh, kind of one is one of my favorite dis uh, uh, discoveries of the last year, I think. <laughs> so, um, in right for optical conductivity, we started from kind of in a linear response regime. Uh, we start with the Kubo formula, where you have just the um, the current current operators, and in the single particle picture, you get the Kubo Greenwood formula, uh, which is actually I just copied from the Vani 90 input uh, from the Vani 90 um, uh, user guide. But for the many body analog, so in this kind of single particle picture, you just have uh, a velocity matrix elements. In the many body analog, you have something you call transport distribution. And now not only do you have this uh, velocity matrix elements, but you also have the spectral function. So this is uh, slightly more complicated. And as I said, prior to, to kind of last year, we would have to go through this route of like evaluating the velocity matrix elements explicitly from a DFT code and so on. And uh, now I uh, kind of, uh, we make use of, of uh, Vani90 and, and the Vani Berry tool to really uh, call this within our kind of DFT routine and do this very quickly through Vani interpolation to the kind of Berry connection. Um, and this is a really great thing. And to show you why this is uh, kind of the many body analog is important. So here's um, the conductivity again for strontium ruthenate. The experimental lines are kind of these uh, drastically oscillating uh, lines. And this is just uh, the uh, the part. So typically for, for optical conductivity, the Drude part has a kind of Lorentzian shape. But you see that in this material, you have kind of like a second, uh, um, uh, I think they call it a non Drude foot, kind of a second foot that is kind of um, very typical for non, uh, for Fermi liquids. And you can, you can, uh, Describe this with in the Kubo formalism. And so this, I, I repeated the calculation with this uh, kind of new implementation, and this gives excellent agreement with, uh, with the prior implementation. Okay, so now uh, I want to briefly talk about the aspect of, of charge full self consistency. Uh, this is a recent implementation um, uh, together with my colleague Alex Hampel, uh, Olivier Parcolet, Claude Ederer from ETH Zurich, and Antoine Josh. Um, Right, so you've seen this kind of outline over DFT plus DMFT now several times. The important part of the char charge self-consistency is really going back from DMFT to uh, DFT to quantum espresso. And for this, you have to compute kind of charge density updates. 
And uh, right, I just want to mention that um, as for the code additions, there were some parts uh, necessary for DMFT, of course, and some parts uh, in quantum special. And this is all handled at the level of HD5 archives, so there's no kind of reading in or uh, files or writing files um, other than that. And uh, there was actually, from, from all the things that were necessary for this project, Vani 90 was in excellent shape. There was nothing to be added. This was really, this is really a pleasure to work with. <laughs> right, so I'm just going to give you a brief glimpse of what, what, is, uh, you know, what, is, what needs to be done for this charge self consistency. So we can describe the interacting charge density if we kind of sum over the lattice greens function, we take the trace, sum over k, sum over the Matsubara frequencies and evaluate this in, in real space. And we can think about this interacting charge density as the Kuhn-Sham charge density plus a correction, right? And uh, here the Kuhn-Sham charge density is kind of the usual uh, uh, square root over the, over the um, Kuhn-Sham states. And so the idea is really to compute this delta rho, and we, you know, we can just subtract the lattice greens function, the interacting lattice greens function, we can subtract the Kuhn-Sham non-interacting one, and this defines the delta n, right? So we just have to evaluate this and kind of feed it back to quantum espresso to recompute the, you know, to construct the new charge density, recompute the potential, and do the whole kind of whole thing again, construct new Vanier functions, and iterate the whole thing. So there's not only the DMFT self-consistency, there's now also that kind of the full charge self-consistency. And so uh, here's the, our benchmarks. This is the orbital polarization and calcium vanadate. So this is a, a pair of guide. And if you apply tensile potential strain, uh, you get uh, for a single, it has a single D electron, so you kind of favor an, an insulating state because you apply a crystal field splitting that kind of favors this, uh, this uh, orbital polarization. And so on the right, you see the occupation of the three T2G states as a function of on-site repulsion, and you also see the, the spectral weight at the Fermi level, which is metallic at low U, and then it drops to zero, meaning that the material is now insulating. And this goes in hand with uh, a dramatic kind of increase in the orbital polarization. And this is particularly strong for the one-shot case, but is quite a bit reduced for the charge self-consistency. So this is one way charge self-consistency can affect your results. And we've benchmarked this against uh, other implementations, so this has, shows excellent agreement with our prior calculations that were done with VASP. And you can also look at this in, you know, in real space. Here's the difference between the charge densities plotted. Um, so the left-hand side is the difference be the, between the, kind of the non-interacting representation of the full charge self-consistent charge density minus the initial Kuhn-Sham state, and on the right-hand side is the one-shot version, and you see that kind of the blue shaded areas are an increase in density, which are kind of the, uh, I think the dxy orbital, and this is uh, overestimated for the one-shot case and slightly lower for the charge self-consistent case. And then there's another example, which is Serum 203, uh, where we did total energy calculations. Um, so we apply strain from minus six to 6%. And you see that for, the, um, for PBE, uh, the lattice constant is slightly underestimated in comparison to the experimental uh, value. Then if we do one-shot calculations, it gets overestimated. But if we do uh, charge self-consistency, we actually get extremely, well, very good agreement with the experiment. And one of the new aspects of this uh, charge self-consistent implementation, I should mention, this has already been used for VIN2K and VASP, um, but one of the, where they use kind of internal projections in the DFT code, and this is usually very diff like difficult to control because all you see is a bunch of numbers and you don't really know what your downfall at Hamiltonian actually kind of looks like or what it does. And one of the new aspects is that, thanks to the Vani 90 interface, we can kind of have excellent control. We can, at each step, look at the band structure again, see if our downfolded Hamiltonian changed drastically or anything else. And we can, uh, you know, track this as function of, of, of uh, iterations. So just to summarize this part, uh, the major benefit of this implementation is really the Vani 90 kind of ecosystem, as was described in the, in the, in the prior, uh, prior days. Um, Yes, so this is a, kind of a, a great addition for us uh, to have more control over the downfolding procedure um, and, and every other aspect of the, of the construction of the local Hamiltonian. Uh, all, con all parts of this uh, implementation are fully open source um, and MPI and K-paralyzed, and this is integrated in quantum Espresso since version 7.0 and recently also in TRIX 3.1, and the workflow is implemented in solid DMFD. Okay, so, right, so this... Uh, summarizes the kind of the introduction to DMFT part. So maybe I'm gonna take like five minutes of questions here and then before I switch to the software part.
Thanks for the great talk. Uh, are there any questions here in presence? One there. So thank you for the talk. It's been really nice. I have a question about the slide that you have shown about the Fermi liquid uh, theory. So I guess that uh, if you think of, you know, a scenario, for example, in which you have a, a non-interacting material and you start increasing uh, the Howard interaction term, then it's going to, uh, if there's a more transition in which the material becomes in, uh, insulator, there's going to be a breakdown of this picture, I guess. So how can we uh, diagnose this breakdown? And in particular, uh, to the more, what happens with the gamma uh, term that is uh, related to the lifetime when you approach this mode transition? Um, that's a good question. Let me think about this. Um, right, so I mean, okay, so you start from an, from an infinite lifetime, right? Uh, so you would have no scattering. And then, um, how would this appear? I'm not sure if there's anything uh, ex super exciting happening with the scattering. I would assume it just uh, increases. I'm not sure if I have anything uh, smarter to say about this. <laughs> but good question. Okay, any other questions? Raise your hand. Okay, there is a question on the chat. Uh, this is my mouse, sorry, thank you. <laughs> How do you construct a vanier function on each step of self-consistent calculations by hand or automatically? That's a good question. Um, so I think initially there were some concerns that, um, you know, when for vanier 90 for the initial uh, vanier functions, you, you know, usually I look very much by hand what the en correct energy window is, did I, did I capture the disentanglement procedure correctly, and so on. And of course, there's a fear that once you introduce this charge density update, uh, things could shift around drastically. But what you have to remember is that your DFT band structure is not going to, there's not going to be a gap opening or anything drastic, right? You're going to do very subtle kind of changes to the charge density, and it turns out that uh, so far, we hadn't, didn't have a single case where uh, things would kind of, if we keep the same parameters, things would screw up drastically. So uh, in, in, in practice, you can just keep the same parameters, but just make sure by kind of checking your Vanier functions each iteration that things haven't gone out of control. I have a follow-up question. That is also a follow-up of yesterday's discussion we had. So. Um, you mentioned it's very important to have the symmetries right in the Vanier functions, you know, for, for, for your workflow. Well, what is it exactly that this, you know, the, in the steps that you showed, what, it, what is that this appears clearly? Because, you know, you know, if, for, a, for to the eye of a non-expert like me, it could be that, you know, I could just throw in some decent Vanier functions and it should work, but actually this is not true. That's an excellent question. Um, so I, um, you, you kind of caught me here. I completely ignored this, this aspect. So what we usually do is, um, let's go to the example of Kaltz and Vanadate. Um, right, so Kaltz and Vanadate is a perovskite, uh, in the perovskite, orthorhombic perovskite structure, which means that it has kind of four uh, vanadium sites, which are by symmetry equivalent. Um, and so it would be really stupid to compute like four impurity problems, right? So we just do a single one, and then we take the self energy and apply the rotations to map them to the different sites. And so if these symmetries are not captured correctly, uh, we might run into trouble. So in practice, we have to like we have to think about this. Is also actually encoded in these projector functions. Uh, let me go back, right? So these projector functions will take care of kind of folding the self energy that you get from the single impurity to all the ones that are symmetry equivalent. There was, a, okay, a question by David. Uh, 
Hi, that's very nice talk. I'm just trying to understand, uh, you know, I uh, live down the hall from Christian Halle, who does, uh, you know, embedded DMFT. So it's DMFT in a kind of a density functional context, self-consistent. So I, I'm trying to understand what is the relation and, and what your method buys you that, for example, that style doesn't buy you. Well, I, I also still try to understand that. <laughs> um, I would say this is a very difficult uh, difficult, difficult question for me to answer. Um, right, so as far as I understand, uh, Christian's method is kind of more from the, from the functional approach, which is really very appealing. And in many ways, uh, I think he also has a real space projector functions, which is also superior to our case, actually. Uh, I'm not sure if our method buys anything extra uh, I would probably, yeah, um, yeah. So I'm not sure I can I can give a conclusive response to that. I think, uh, well, yeah. I mean, I would have to probably get my hands on and code the other route in order to understand this better. There was another question the, the, down there. Ah, Ivo. I was just curious if uh, your uh, setup for including correlations in the optical conductivity also works with spin orbit coupling. So would you have access to the, for example, magneto-optical uh, part of the response in magnetic materials? Um, uh, we did not consider that yet, I think, magnetic materials. Um, I'm, I'm also not sure if I can answer that. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is a kind of a recent development, so we've only looked at just been kind Looks of... Looks very promising, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? We have actually a minute, so, so if you but want... I, I actually kind of... So the second part of... Sorry, maybe I was unclear. I'm still going to use part of this lecture for the software part. Ah, okay. So okay, okay, so then you can just go on. Okay. Right. So now for the, the software part, um, right, so here I should uh, mention the main maintainers and kind of inventors of the TRIX software project, Niels Wenzel, who's a data scientist at CCQ, then my colleague Alex Hampel, who's in the audience and who's gonna help with the tutorial later too. He actually constructed most of the tutorials, so I should give uh, all the credit to him. Uh, he's also a data scientist. Uh, then we have uh, Michel Ferriero, who uh, has a group in, in Paris, and then Olivier Parcoulet. So what is TRIX? TRIX uh, stands for a toolbox on, for research on interacting quantum systems. It contains both the TRIX library, which is kind of the fundamental building blocks of the software, and then it contains a series of applications that are based on this TRIX library. It's fully open source. Uh, it's high level interfaces in Python 3, Python 3 right? Uh, low level is uh, modern C++. So this makes it a very kind of very efficient implementation. Of course, there's a lot of people uh, involved, but I'm not gonna go through this here. Um, so kind of you can think about tricks or try to summarize it in a slide as well. If DMFT is kind of your hammer, tricks is your toolbox, and then you can, you can you know, apply to the materials. Uh, the fundamental building blocks uh, are kind of Green's, implementation of Green's function objects that are really kind of the basis of every, every sort of, every calculation that you wanna do. It has HDF5 support, so everything works via HDF5. Uh, there's this kind of C++ to Python layer. It's fully open source fully MPI parallelized to speed things up. We have our own statistics package for the QMC, um, uh, the quantum Monte Carlo analysis. We have integration tests and a bunch of tutorials if you're interested. And here's just kind of an excerpt of what this looks like. So in Python, you would uh, import from trick screens function. You can import a mesh, an imaginary frequency mesh or real frequency and a greens function. You can define your mesh as a fermionic mesh uh, at a specific temperature and a specific number of Matsubara frequencies, and then you can kind of feed this to create a Green's function, and then for the Green's function, you can just uh, put your uh, Vani Hamiltonian in. And that's as simple as that. And then you can also do, uh, you know, you can you have access to the many body operators, like, a, uh, like N or, uh, or the annihilation and creation operators, and you can do exact diagonalization and so on. So this is just a fundamental building box, which is already um, a lot. So Trix, uh, the packaging, we have, uh, you can install it via Anaconda. Uh, we have Debian packages, uh, Binder, Docker images, 
singularity and, and easy build. You can ask Alex if, you, if you're interested in, in uh, downloading it. We have a bunch of tutorials. We actually also have a summer school coming up in, in Canada, which is uh, held every two years. Um, right, and I promised you to show this example of the beta letters. So uh, again, we have this uh, exact or kind of uh, analytic expression for a density of states. You import all the important things from, from tricks. Here's a bunch of definitions like bandwidth or chemical potential. Then you initialize a solver. Uh, you construct your uh, Green's function from a semicircular density of states. You're gonna do, um, I think we said five iterations, five DMFT loops, where you do like a, a spin averaging of the up and down channel, and then you feed this uh, into, the, into the curly G, where you just take uh, T square, so half bandwidth over two, uh, to the square times your Green's function. You plug this into your solver by def and also defining um, an interaction in Maltonian, and that's it. For the beta lattice, it is that simple. Of course, for real materials, it's not that simple. Uh, then you can look at, at your Green's function as a function of, of iterations. So this would be a uh, metallic state. And we actually have an own kind of uh, matplotlib implementation that makes it easier. So it's called oplot. It makes it easier to look at Green's function objects. Okay, so this is the fundamental building blocks. There's a couple of applications. I'm just gonna talk about uh, three of these. There's kind of the DFD tool side, which is really the glue to all the initial codes. There's solid DMFT, which is kind of an optimized way to run the whole kind of call, uh, the whole routine. There's MaxEnd, which does the analytic continuation. And then there's a, a whole range of impurity solvers where you really take one for each, each problem. Uh, so this summarizes this a bit more. I'm not gonna talk about the cluster extension or vertex methods, but focus on um, the DFT plus DMFT part. So we have kind of interfaces to all known or popular DFT codes and then the whole range of impurity solvers and solid DMFT which runs this. So this is DFT tools. Um, uh, historically, this was interfaced with Lean2K but uh, has been interfaced with Vani90 for a very long time. Uh, there's also an like, internal interface with VASP and quantum responses uh, mainly via uh, uh, Vani90. A recent implementation with ELK and uh, we're, our coll colleague Olivier Jean Gras working on Abinet. And what DFT tools does is really kind of these basic, uh, basic, um, basic functions that I've talked about in, in, during, during the talk, like constructing a lattice greens function or extracting the local greens function, which is just really the sum over K, um, downfolding and upfolding, meaning this kind of uh, projector functions, uh, calculating the chemical potential or the transport distribution. Then as for the impurity solvers, I'm not going to go into details here, uh, the most uh, important one is uh, CT Hype, which is uh, a QMC solver. I think also the one that uh, Christian Howley uses the most. Um, we have CT Sec, CT Int, and so on. Uh, the more imp main important aspect is that we have mapped out most of the like, difficult spaces of materials, but there are still challenges. Um, one of them being strong off diagonal hybridization, spin orbit coupling, and low temperature. Uh, there's recent kind of next generation sol solvers, which is uh, fork tensor product states. That's actually the self energy that produced the self energy that I've shown in the in the slides. There's inchworm, and, and then there's a recent addition, which is kind of a Harchi Fox solver that was developed by Jonathan Karp under the supervision of Alex. So he can he can respond uh, to questions about that, and this makes it kind of really exciting because this is really a kind of a DFT plus U solver but using Vanu functions. Right. Uh, then. I'll briefly talk about Solid DMFT, which is a project with uh, Max Merkel and Alberto Carter from ETH Zurich, um, under, again, the supervision of Alex Hampel. Um, so this is, uh, you know, this, uh, you can look at the documentation, but the workflow I've, you know, I've uh, shown you this several times, kind of just handles all the, uh, all the parts that are necessary for the DFT plus DMFT calculation. This can actually be handled like a, a bit like a DFT code. So you have a, a, a config file where you specify all the necessary things for DMFT. You call the executable and you write all the greens functions are getting written into an HDF5 archive, but you also have an observable file to track uh, the convergence, like uh, tracking the op occupation or the chemical potential. And we also have convergence metrics where you see the change in the impurity greens function and so on. And so this can be installed like any other tricks application and is uh, scalable with scriptable config files. What we really kind of put emphasis on is the reproducibility. Um, so it has versioning control, HF5 storage, we have convergence metrics, and we have a very flexible impurity solver choice that are developed at, uh, at, at the Flatiron Institute uh, that I've also mentioned, CTHype, CTSEC, and so on. 
and of course online documentation and tutorials. So then I'm gonna use the last two minutes to uh, uh, introduce our latest edition. This is uh, Tricks for MEC, which is a web app that you're also uh, going to see in the tutorial. Um, so this is a project again with Alex, uh, Niels, Olivier, and Antoine, and is based on input of Vani90 and Trix, um, and is based on uh, Plotly Dash on the, on the software side. And if you want to break down this code into a single line, what it does is compute the spectral function that you've seen several times. And the only input that you need is the Vani Hamiltonian and a self-energy, and the self-energy can either be computed within codes like solid DMFD, or you can also do uh, kind of analytical approaches where uh, you give like uh, Fermi liquid uh, parameters. And so this uh, web is online, you can test it now, but I prefer if you do it in the tutorial. Um, and I'm just going to finish by showing a, a quick kind of clip uh, what this looks like. So uh, you can upload a full H5 uh, config, I'm gonna skip the tight binding parts, but you can recompute it, I'm stopping here for a second, you can recompute it on a different, uh, uh, you know, different K path and so on, change, uh, you can compute the chemical potential automatically, and now we're going to uh, enter a self energy, you can either upload it or enter manually in terms of quasi-particle renormalization for the three different orbitals, for example, and also a um, correlation induced crystal field splitting, and you have to enter a broadening and then you compute the spectral function. This takes a second in the background. And there you have the spectral function. Uh, we also have an EDC, which is an energy distribution curve, which is just a vertical line through the spectral function. And you have an MDC momentum distribution curve, which is kind of a horizontal line, and you can, uh, you can just click uh, and get the corresponding data. Uh, you can show, you can also plot the quasi-particle dispersion, you can change the color scheme and so on. We also have the Fermi surface and hopefully soon optical spectroscopy. Takes a second again. So now we, of course, we need a, we use Vani interpolation to get a much nicer kind of uh, uh, representation. And this just inherits everything from the prior slide. There we go. Okay. All right, so with this, the software part is uh, finished in my talk as well. Thank you very much for your attention.